Fire away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're now a month into 2020, and with the Super Bowl and Groundhog Day behind us, no offense on Groundhog Day, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, and Ouch. pictures... Wait, and, wait a minute. <laughs> This has not started well. <laughs> and, and pitchers and catchers reporting soon. I don't know about you, but it's starting to feel like spring, particularly with the weather this week. In a moment, you're going to hear from Chief Mike LaPetri to my right on what we're seeing regarding the crime picture in New York City. Let me be clear here. While we're seeing challenges, and there are challenges, we're also at the same time excited about where we are in 2020. Excited about the opportunities to build on neighborhood policing, and our new youth initiative. Excited to continue to attack crime, if you will, before it gets entrenched. Excited because I know and I hear it every day from New Yorkers around the city about the positive work being done throughout New York City between our cops and all the communities they serve. Integral to this type of work is this center here where we sit, the Police Athletic League. I want to thank the entire staff here, and I, I know Fred is around somewhere, for hosting us today. For more than 100 years, the PAL has been a close partner of the NYPDs, playing a crucial role in the lives of New York City's children. There are programs that revolve around academics, athletics, the arts, juvenile justice. Most importantly, the PAL inspires young people to realize their full potential. I can tell you that over the past two or three decades, the men and women of the NYPD as well have done truly remarkable things to make and to keep New Yorkers safe. Recently, you've heard us speak about our renewed focus on our city's young people and the necessity to help keep them on the right path. This is a multi-pronged approach that absolutely must include the full efforts of every city agency, every elected official, every community and faith-based organization, really every person and group in the city that we serve. This has to be a citywide effort, not just the NYPD, but we're certainly happy to take the lead and to work hard to organize it. In fact, our new youth coordination officers will be the nexus of all those efforts. They'll identify the kids on the cusp of crime, find the right programs, and make critical connections on their behalf. We're determined to breathe new life into programs all across this great city, and we're determined to bring everyone to the table to get it done. It's all part of our vow that we will not cede an inch in our mission to vigorously fight and prevent crime and to never forget the victims of crime, while at the same time continuing to build trust with every resident. The people who remain our greatest partners ensuring the highest levels of public safety for all. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mayor de Blasio. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Commissioner, to you and all the leadership of the NYPD here, I want to thank you uh, we're starting this year with a really important change of direction in terms of this focus on young people, and we'll be talking about it a lot more in the coming days. But this is how we get to the root of the challenge in this city. Our young people need to be reached in an entirely different way, and the NYPD is going to take the lead in that effort. And I think you're going to see that allow us to get at crime at the root in a more structural way than ever before. This is something very different than the NYPD has attempted in its history. I know how passionate Commissioner Shea is about this focus on youth. I think it is going to be something transformative for this city and for this department. We're here at Harlem PAL because this is a place that epitomizes already that crucial work. And we think about Police Athletic League, and we think about the connection between our officers and our young people. It's been out there in a variety of ways for a long time, but it's never been approached in the strategic way the Commissioner has now outlined. And I think it's going to make a big difference. I want to thank everyone at Harlem PAL, especially Frederick Watts, Executive Director, and Marcel Braithwaite, Director for Community Engagement. Thank you for the good work that you do and everyone here on your team does. So I'm hopeful about the new direction the NYPD is taking, and I am very hopeful always about the NYPD because of its history of success. And at the same time, we are all up here looking very squarely at the challenge that we see in front of us with the facts that have come to us uh, throughout the month of January. 
Overall crime up almost 17 percent among those key index crimes. That's cause for real concern. We take it seriously. We are focused on it. We can confront it and we can overcome it because that is the history of the NYPD. Now we've seen for a quarter century the NYPD always is able to confront each challenge and come up with new strategies and approaches. Some of those are going to be immediate, and you'll hear about some of that today, but also, again, the big directional change on focusing on youth is going to pay dividends many times over going forward. Even though the broad direction in January causes us real concern, it's also very important to note that, again, these, all these statistics are this January compared to last January. Important good news, murders down, rape down this January compared to last. So we see some things that are going in the right direction. We want to keep building on that. But the bottom line is I have absolute faith in the NYPD. A lot of tools at their disposal. They're adding new ones as we speak in terms of this youth strategy. And I have confidence that we'll get to the right place. The concept around approaching young people, I want to emphasize this idea of taking what was created with neighborhood policing, with the idea of a neighborhood coordinating officer, and now playing that out to a youth coordination officer, someone who thinks all the time about how to help kids and families, how to make sure if there's a sign of a problem that it's addressed right away so a kid does not get into trouble, does not go on the wrong path, literally taking that child who might have ended up being part of the problem and making sure it never gets to that point. Uh, that, to me, is extraordinary, and I think it's going to yield great dividends again because we've seen it with neighborhood policing. I know we'll see it with the youth initiative as well. The fact is we have great examples, and this PAL Center is one of them, where there's been a very tight bond between officers of the 2-8 precinct and young people in this community. We've seen what it can do when that is fostered. It's going to now go to a much higher level all over this city. Now, I'll conclude by saying this, and then just a few words in Spanish. The whole idea over these last six years is to create trust, to create a dialogue between police and community, to create greater respect. Uh, for years and years, you've heard all around the desire for more respect, community members, desiring more respect from police, police desiring more respect from community members. What neighborhood policing has allowed us to do is to actually bring those strands together and create mutual respect, create a bond. We see the positive impact it has. I want to say that what we saw on Friday was the exact opposite. A very small number of protesters, and I want to remind you, in a city of 8.6 million people, we're talking about a handful of protesters. But what they did was absolutely inappropriate. They claim to be representing a cause, and yet what they did would not help any cause. Vandalism doesn't help any cause. Spewing vile at police does not help any cause. It was disrespectful, did not represent the views of the overwhelming majority of New Yorkers. And I want to be very clear, that kind of thing isn't going to move us forward. And you did not see New Yorkers uh, pick up on that and engage that very small group of people. I think a lot of people were repulsed. I certainly was one of them. So I just want to say that kind of activity gets us nowhere and is unacceptable. What we need to do is respect each other. And I want to say what I think New Yorkers saw, but I want to say it very vividly, it is not easy for our officers who are there to protect everyone's democratic rights, and they did so brilliantly. They protected the right to protest even when horrible and inappropriate things were being said to our officers. But that's, again, an indication of the quality NYPD. Our democratic values are upheld every day by the NYPD. And it doesn't matter which cause or which position is being taken by protesters. The NYPD treats everyone the same and maintains the peace. So I want to commend all of our officers who on Friday had to put up with a lot but showed a lot of professionalism the whole way through. With that, a few quick words in Spanish. En el mes de enero hubo más crimen en general, pero menos homicidios. Tenemos toda la confianza de que la policía de Nueva York aborde el desafío 
y con oficiales dedicados a la juventud. La policía afrontará las raíces del crimen. With that, I'm going to turn to our Chief of Crime Control Strategies, Mike Lepetri. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. And thank you to the men and women of the NYPD who go out there every day and do a very difficult job. So like the Commissioner said, for January, overall index crime did increase 1,222 crimes, or approximately 16.9%. But as we all know, those 1,222 crimes affect many more victims. We're going to talk about the rise of grand loss in the auto. It's not just the owner of that vehicle who it affects. How about the family that needs that vehicle to travel to work, to school? How about the family of three, four, or five that their house got broken into? It just doesn't affect the owner of the residence. How about the children that have to sleep there every night knowing that somebody broke into their house and went through their bedroom and stole things from their residence? So let's think about the victims not just crime numbers. So as I said, five out of seven index crimes rose in 2019. We saw rises in robbery, felony assault, burglary, and grand larceny. We saw this across the city of New York, not just centered in one borough or one patrol borough. Every patrol borough rose in these five uh, major categories, with Staten Island seeing a very slight decrease. Shooting incidents rose in January of 2020. 57, 67 shooting incidents with 80 victims compared to 52 with 56 victims last year. And I will get specifically into each one of these index crimes. Overall housing crimes rose 8.7% or 32 crimes. We saw an increase in the borough of Manhattan, specifically housing borough Manhattan North saw an increase of 27 crimes. What's driving those crimes? Robberies. What's driving those robberies? The same thing that drove the robberies for the past six months of 2020, that I'm sorry, 2019, that continues to drive the robberies of 2020. Young groups of youths robbing other young victims, targeting their electronics. Transit crime. Transit crime saw an increase of 60 crimes, when you look at where those crimes are increasing, Transit Borough Brooklyn, specifically Brooklyn North Transit, saw an, saw an increase of 25 crimes, again, being driven by robberies. Same motives as what we've seen citywide, young groups of individuals robbing other young victims. As far as hate crimes, the mayor touched on, uh, on the hate crimes. We've seen an increase, I'm sorry, a decrease in hate crimes this year 29 versus 38. When we, look, when we looked at uh, the, de the decrease in the motivation of anti-Semitic, we're also down 21 versus 25. The vast majority, 16 out of those 21, are being driven by swastikas. Murder. We've seen an increase in murder, 23 victims versus 29, 22 this year, we have one reclass from 2020. Uh, the person passed away on in 2017, and the medical examiner deemed it a homicide this year. So out of the 22 incidents that happened this year, we do see an increase in domestic violence murders, seven versus five. All seven we have arrests for. One involved a child. Out of those seven, three were shot, two were stabbed, one was asphyxiated, and one was blunt trauma. Shooting incidents. Like I said before, we had 67 shooting incidents with 80 victims. We have a lot more multiple uh, shooting incidents with multiple victims this year. When we look at who is either a victim or a perpetrator in the 67 incidents, we see a large increase of somebody being on parole or probation. So 21 out of our 67 incidents, or 31.3%, either involve either somebody on parole or probation. That is the largest number that we've seen since we started recording this back in 2003. Rape. 
we do see a decrease in rape, 127 versus 155. We've also seen we're at the lowest percentage since 2017 of rape complaints prior to 2020. So again, you know, we're continuing to reach out to victims. So that is, you know, that's something that we all know it's an underreported crime. But 45 percent of our rape complaints are prior to 2020. That's the lowest since 2017. Robberies. We've been struggling robberies for, for the past few months. When you look at multiple perp incidents, we're up 140 robberies this year, or 36 percent. Shoplift gone bad. We've seen an increase in shoplifting, not, on our grand, not only on our grand larceny side, as far as pay larceny and grand larcenies, but we also see individuals going into stores, attempting to take merchandise, and either a store worker or the owner of that small business trying to stop those individuals, force is used, that is now a robbery. Okay, we see an increase, we see an increase in that. As far as our arrests, we are up, we are up with, uh, with robbery arrest overall, and we're also up with under 18 perpetrators, and also we are up in under 18 victims. 26% 26, 26 of all our robbery perpetrators this year are under the age of 18. So like the commissioner said, like the mayor said, with our new youth strategy. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, Commissioner Shea shared the kickoff to, to the youth strategy with, with the district attorneys, with Corp Corporation Council, and many other principals present at one police plaza. The actual first youth forum, or youth stat, will take place on February 14th, which will be chaired by myself and Chauncey Parker. We are going to have the whole borough of Manhattan present. Some of you might say, why did you pick Manhattan? Well, Manhattan continues to struggle in youth-related robberies and youth-related crime, as it did in 2019, and it continues in 2020. So what are some of the considerations that are we going to be doing for the Youth Forum? We're going to be looking at a lot of different things. We're going to be looking at youths who are on a domestic incident report, whether as the offender or the victim, that have never been arrested before in their life. We are going to be looking at youths who are also on a domestic incident report six or more times that have been arrested. We are going to be looking at approximately 50, we're going to be looking at a few youths who live in the borough of Manhattan, commit their crimes in the borough of Manhattan, and have been arrested 10 or more times in their life with two robbery arrests in 2019. We are also going to look at additional cases and identify points of possible missed opportunities for intervention. Felony assaults. Domestic violence felony assaults have risen 14 percent, approximately 100 victims. That's approximately 43 percent of all our felony assaults this year are driven by domestic violence. We have arrests on about 80 percent of those, and as I spoke before, we have arrests on all our domestic violence murders. We do see an uptick in homeless shelter assaults in the city. We have an increase of, of 14, 16 versus 2. Five of those are on employees, 11 of them are resident on resident. Burglary, being driven by residential and commercial burg. So we talk about the buildings and we also talk about the dwellings. Every borough, except every patrol borough except Queen South and Staten Island sees an increase. Grand larceny. Grand larceny, we're up approximately 9.6% or 358 victims. When we look at what's driving our grand larcenies, we see an in increase in car breaks, not only on the grand larceny side of it, but the petty larceny side of it. What else do we also see? Shoplift, not, also, not only on the grand larceny side of it, but the petty larceny side of it. Again, these are individuals going into hardworking people's business or other large corporations, taking property and leaving. Mm -hmm. Grand larceny auto, spiking throughout the city, up approximately 71% or 243 vehicles, but as I stated before, many more victims. What's driving those grand larcenies? 
keys being left, key files being left in the vehicle, keys that are, cars that are left running. We also see an increase in Ford Econoline vans. We've seen this before. Unfortunately, uh, they're older, a lot of these are older models. They're easy to steal and, and uh, perpetrators do use those Ford Econolines for other crimes. As far as, uh, you know, we talked about the increase in shooting incidents. The city, one of the toughest things to do, one of the most dangerous things to do is take a gun off the street. So we do see an increase in gun arrests. We do see an increase in felony arrests. Thank you. So I, I want to apologize. I noticed as Mike's talk, and uh, I think it looks like we have some technical difficulties there. Hopefully we get it squared away with the PowerPoint. I think it was showing some old slides, but I'll uh, Start with on topic, crime. Commissioner, um, and I guess uh, Robert, what do you think is driving this spike in so many of the index crimes since the beginning? Of the year? Yeah, Katie. So I, I think I'm well, well on the record. Um, of some of my concerns of late. Um, you know, I've gotten a few people said to me, "Well, how are you? How are you so positive?" I'm, I'm so positive because. I know the work of the men and women of this department and what they're capable of doing. So um, challenges are not something new that's thrown up in our way. Um, you know, Mike, Terry, every Thursday chair, chair a ComStat meeting where they drill down with incredible level of uh, sophistication onto what's driving crime in New York City. Um, and, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to keep New Yorkers safe. I know you said it before, but just, I mean, do you attribute it to the new bail reform? Listen, I, I, Katie, I'm on record, um, but the, the important thing here is um, what are we doing about it? And, and what are we doing to keep New Yorkers safe? And that's something that we all agree on. A and, um, you know, we, we will um, do everything in our power to make sure that we, we remember the victims. We do everything we can to prevent crime in New York City. And I purposefully started out with the youth strategy today because that's attacking crime from beyond the traditional ways that we will attack crime, working with our partners in the criminal justice system. That's probably an even more important aspect to this. Attacking crime, building upon neighborhood policing that so much with Rodney to my right, Fausto to my right, Terry to my left, have put into place in the last couple of years and keeping people from ever getting involved. This, where we are sitting here, is the prime example of that. So, you know, I have utmost confidence in, in all of our partners, but most importantly, the peop people that put a blue uniform on every day that will keep people safe. Ashley. Commissioner, in your editorial in The Times, you said that you predicted that the bail reform would uh, uh, facilitate the release of people who were responsible for hundreds of crimes. Is there any evidence from January arrests that any of those people were released um, because, because of the bail reform, the new bail law, who would not have been released under the old law? And how do you uh, compute that? Yeah. I'll keep it. I'll keep it as um, brief. I think the, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I, I stand by those comments. I think that, you know, with the, the passing, of the new law, we we saw a pretty pretty, uh, pretty dramatic increase in the people that were let out of Rikers uh, in, in accordance with the law, and that's something that we will deal with. Uh, and to the second point of your question, um, we have seen, you know, Mike could get into example of after example, but. We have seen examples of people getting arrested post January 1st and then getting rearrested. So I think the answer to your question is yes. But again, um, this is not this is not our first rodeo either in the NYPD. And laws come and laws go, and we adapt. And, and the the dedication of the men and women of this department, the ingenuity to build cases differently, to work with our partners in the criminal justice system, to work with the people that live and go to work every day in these communities to get them involved. Um, we will, we have a challenge here, but we will get past this challenge and we'll continue to drive crime down in New York City. But is there any hard data? Because we can, there have been examples in the tabloids and other papers, but is there any hard data that there are people being released who would not have been released under the old law who have reoffended? Yes, and we can follow up and get you that data. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Talking about the bail issue is one of the factors that 
maybe behind it, apparently behind the crime increase. Are there other things you've given thought to, such as so the market reduction in stop and frisk, uh, which may or may not no. be opening no. criminals? No. No. I think that. Uh, Listen, this is, this is what I've done for the last six plus years. And probably whenever I do leave, and there's no plan to leave, but what I will be most proud of is how we changed uh, how we police in this city and gotten more effective by doing uh, less stops, Tony. So that, that precision piece, I mean, if you went to a single comp stat, you would hear precinct commanders, lieutenants of detective squads, sergeants talk with incredible clarity and detail about their subject matter expertise and talking about individuals, what school they go to or, or who their parole officer is or when they were arrested last and how we have changed how we police in this city, moving away from 700,000 stops. Um, we do not want to go back there and that has no correlation to me and that is my opinion. Uh, where we are today. We, we can absolutely continue to drive crime down without going back to that. Marsha. Uh, Commissioner, I wonder how you feel about statements made today by, uh, by Pat Lynch and the PBA saying that we're in a public safety emergency, that bail reform is not the cause of our problem, and that the problem is caused by what he calls failed leadership and a political culture that denigrates and devalues the work of the police officers. What was that last part? He said that, that the problem is caused by what he calls failed leadership and a political culture that denigrates and devalues the work of the NYPD. This is a question for you and for the mayor. Yeah, uh, I would disagree with that. I, I think that you know, when, when times get tough, that's when it's more important than ever to work together. And, and that goes within the police department, within the union ranks, within elected officials and everyone else. Um, you know, we have challenges here. There is no doubt. Mike, Mike related some of those numbers that are obviously I have said are concerning to me. Uh, I think for all the right reasons, because I'm concerned about New Yorkers. But I also at the same time, I'm optimistic and have confidence. And um, it, it's more important than ever that we find the common ground, pull together, and, and find our way uh, to keep New Yorkers safe. New Yorkers say that they don't feel safe and they felt that they didn't feel safe even before Bell and Form went into effect. Well, then we have more work to do. I mean, I, I certainly am out and about. Um, that's, that's our prime goal, whether you talk about a month or two ago when we went through that pretty significant uptick in, in hate crimes, and, and I'm been out there many times myself. I know Terry has, I know Fausto has, and that's by design, to make people see us, to talk to people, to engage with people, but also to make them feel safe. And so it's a, it's a multi-layered, it's about the deployment and stopping it and making people feel safe. And, and uh, I'm sure that you could find somebody that, that feels that way, but then we have more work to do. And that's really what, what our job is day in and day out. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, uh, Marsha, I really think there's two kinds of people in New York City. There's people who are rooting for New York City and people who are rooting against New York City. Uh, look, I'm here with the leaders of the finest police force on earth who have driven down crime the last six years in a row uh, while building a much stronger relationship with communities. I give them immense credit for doing that. And by the way, you take the big picture look, it's been a quarter century of success for the NYPD. So if the head of a police union or anyone else wants to say that this city's going the wrong direction. They are rooting against New York City. They are wishing for New York City to fail. And that's for their own political reasons. Let's be clear. You cannot look at a quarter century of consistent progress and ignore it. Everyday New Yorkers get that. They're smart. They understand the NYPD has done an amazing job. And they like the direction. And not just some, I'm talking about the vast majority of New Yorkers want to see a tighter bond between the NYPD and communities and feel we have left a lot of those divisions in the past. So we're always going to have challenges. But if you have faith in the NYPD, this is the great irony. Do you have faith in the NYPD or not? I do. I do. Maybe Mr. Lynch doesn't. I do. I'm telling you, show me how we could drive down crime for six years in a row, put 2,000 more officers on the street, repair the division between police and community, and that that's not progress. Of course it's progress, but Marsha, 
there are some people rooting against New York City. Let's be clear. Some people think that's advantageous to their political uh, position. Some people think that helps them get attention. It's really, really clear. If you have eyes to see, you know it's the safest big city in America. That doesn't mean the work is done. There's lots more work to do. But it's the safest big city in America. That's just a fact. Gloria. Commissioner, uh, so it sounds like you are directing uh, uh, that the, the you do see a correlation between the increase and the changes to bail reform. And I know you said you were on record, but I just wondered if you could go further and if you could respond to um, advocates who are saying that the police department shouldn't be drawing a conclusion based on a month of police data, that that's not enough information to draw a trend. And for the mayor, I wonder if you, if you agree with the conclusion of your police commissioner, which is that there's a direct correlation between these two changes. I'm going to jump in, and I understand it is the job, and I respect it, it is the job of the media to ask the same question over and over, day in, day out, week in, week out. We've both spoken to this a bunch of times, very clearly, uh, and we are in the same place. Now, I think the statistical point, I'm just going to say it as a layman. I'm not the expert some of these guys are. We saw things emanating from this law starting to take effect months ago, and obviously now it's in full effect. But the bottom line is, one, we've been 100 percent clear and we are unified on what we feel. Two, we want to act on this productively. So my view here is we've raised concerns. We're in dialogue with leaders in Albany about those concerns, and we want to move forward. In the meantime, this police force can handle anything thrown at them. They always have. So I'm not, I for one, I'm not going to keep repeating what I've said a bunch of times. It's there. But what I'm confident about is there's a way forward, not only in the ways that we're going to adjust strategies and specific approaches, which is what Comstat is all about. Uh, but also, I believe the dialogue in Albany will be productive. Commissioner, can you speak to the criticism that there isn't enough information to be coming up with a trend? I think I, I've, I've said it before, Gloria. Um, you know, um, when, when, when I say something, I'll, I'll say it because I think it has to be said in terms of speaking up for the victims of crime. I stand behind what I said. But again, we have to work together now. What's the way forward? Um, I'm wondering, because there's, there's protests in Albany happening today with some of the other law enforcement unions. They're asking for these rollbacks to be considered. And we're at a crime staff press conference, so I'm not sure. Let me, let me just, I'll, I'll say the last thing on this. Another reason why I'm optimistic here, because I, I think I think we on the law enforcement side, as well as the defense side, and well as the prosecution side, have a unique lens into how the criminal justice system works. I, I think that every time I speak on the bail reform, it's in support of it, in the principle of it, why it was done. I think that is all essential part of this discussion. Leveling the playing field, being fair about criminal justice in New York. I think we can get to a good place with small fixes. Uh, Tony. Commissioner, uh, related, we've talked about this. Apart from bail reform, there's been an issue of discovery <laughs> reform. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and Is that a different topic, Tony? Well, it's sort of a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, a new chapter, Tony. Uh, are you, was the discovery <laughs> changes and a possibility? And I think there are fears that witnesses were going to be intimidated coming forward. Did that throw neighborhood police in sort of a curveball? <laughs> Well documented, Tony, that it's a concern of mine. But again, um, you know, I've been, all, I've been all around this country. Where would you rather be than New York City with everything that New York City is, with every different neighborhood, with the people that you meet? People in New York City and, and our cops, uh, we will get through this. Is it a challenge? Absolutely, it's a challenge. But we, we will find our way out of this. Katie? Um, so Thank you. Question. And it's for you and it's for the mayor. So I know there's an uptick in assaults in homeless shelters, and I was wondering if there's any indication as to what's driving that, and for the mayor, if there's any concern about the security at these homeless shelters. I know the, um, the security company at one of the 
homeless shelters is under investigation for uh, contract issues. So is that a concern? Is that something that you and DHS and DSS and DHRA are, are looking at with the NYPD? Yeah, the crucial part is the with the NYPD part. So. Katie, for years and years, there was a fundamental mistake made in the city, which is that the NYPD was not connected to shelter security. And what we did a few years ago is to, we devoted the idea of, uh, to the, ourselves to the idea that the NYPD would supervise shelter facility and train uh, shelter security and train shelter security. This was a watershed to take the ability of the NYPD and ensure that shelters were being uh, made secure in a much more modern, effective way. That doesn't mean it's over. There's this obviously a lot of complexities to keeping a shelter safe, and we're looking at everything when we see a situation like that and anything we need to improve. But I also have seen real progress, and I am convinced we can continue to make the shelter safer. And I think it's interesting. For a long time, people were looking at a statistic, very importantly, were homeless people coming off the street and the, correction, the connection between their concerns about safety and whether they're willing to come off the street. We now saw with Homestat 2,450 people come off the street. That is an indicator that the message has gotten out there, the security situation is better and there are shelters you can go to and be safe, but we definitely have more work to do. Settlement Housing Fund came out with a survey where 50% of domestic violence victims in shelters felt they were unsafe. And it's largely because the HRA shelters don't have capacity for all the victims in the city. Um, and now we hear that 34% of um, uh, felony assault victims are domestic violence victims. So I'm wondering if you can address that. Yeah, look, we there's especially with domestic violence, which is an area that we have to do so much more on as a society, let alone a city. If those survivors don't feel safe, we've got work to do, unquestionably. And we will go and assess uh, what's happening in those facilities and what we need to do better. Uh, I hear that, I take it very seriously. Anything else on the crime numbers, Rocco? Oh, uh, I was surprised that uh, in mentioning the uh the recidivism in crime uh, that you mentioned uh, probation and parole, but you didn't mention bail. I was wondering if there was any reason for that. As, as bail as far as what? As far as the people who are out on bail committing crimes. Um, you mentioned parole, you mentioned probation, but you didn't mention bail. Is that a major factor in the it's something that we look at, and you know, I have no problem getting back to you and giving you some of my data. So there were a few blocks from where Tessa Majors was murdered. I was wondering if you could provide us with an update on that case, and also the status of the park, and whether you've seen any change in robberies and crimes this month, mm -hmm. uh, given what happened to that woman. Yeah, it's not that, safe for students at the Thanks, Jonathan. And it's, it's hard to come to this building and uh, not think about Morningside Park, but literally right here. Um, I'll turn it over to Rodney, Chief Harrison in a second um, on the investigation. But in terms of the park, um, Fausto Pachado to my right uh, put a lot of work in, uh, working with the community, working with different uh, leaders in terms of providing increased deployment, <clears throat> working on uh, obtaining lighting for the park that wasn't in place before. Uh, Probably for all of these reasons, we've seen a pretty significant uh, drop off in reported crime uh, in the park since that incident, which is a positive. Unfortunately, it's um, not changing what happened. I'll, I'll turn it to Rodney in terms of the investigation. So good afternoon, um, and I'm gonna apologize in advance. Um, if everybody can't understand this by now, it's a judicial process that we don't wanna have compromised. Uh, we're working hand in hand with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, but um, I don't, at this time, I'm not going to discuss uh, the intricacies of the case uh, regarding um, the investigation. Sorry, Jonathan. I, you knew that was the answer, though. So we have to go back to the actual month of January would be 2014. Uh, 2014, we had 8,745 crimes. Uh, as far as a increase comparing it to the prior years, 
uh, month, uh, you have to go back to 11 and 12 to see uh, somewhat of, of the same amount of raw number increase. Okay, so just to make sure I understand that correctly, the, the January 2014 is the last month there was this total number of... That, well, comparing it to January, I just, yeah, but if you look at total crime last year, July, August, September, October, all those months had more raw numbers than this January. Right. Look, we, 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 we understand the issues. Again, let's, let's remember, we're talking about victims here. We're not talking about complaint reports. We're talking about victims. And that's, you know, the NYPD is all about public safety and serving the community of the city of New York. So, you know, if you want to ask me numbers, I, I can give you as anything you want. But let's just remember the victims and let's remember, you know, why we're here today. Do yes, sir. Do your envision changes for the bail reform laws? Would they provide any more resources or alternative paths to people with mental illnesses? I'm sorry, repeat the last part again. Do your envision changes for the bail reform laws provide any alternative paths or resources or options for judges dealing with defendants with mental illnesses? Again, uh, there's a productive dialogue going on with leaders in Albany. Uh, we're not going to talk about the specifics of that dialogue. I mean, we're looking at a number of factors. Uh, I can say separate from that, we're always looking at the question of how to address mental health and its connection to criminal justice, which is an area that needs a lot more work. But in terms of specific conversations with leaders in Albany that we think will be part of getting to solutions, we're not going to lay out those details. Um, recently at a meeting in Sunnyside, Chief of Department Monaghan urged representatives report, residents reportedly to contact state representatives about or, the bail reform laws. Is that something you support um, officers advocating for public policy change, especially uniformed officers? I'll let the uh, chief speak for himself, but uh, again, I don't think we could be more clear. The commissioner and I have made our position clear. Just let me finish what I'm saying. The commissioner and I have made our position clear, and there's work going on to address the issue, including in Albany. So that's how we're approaching this as a city, as a police department. We're all on the same approach here, period. And as a city, everyone in the media is talking about this, this issue. So at community council meetings throughout the city, we're explaining to people what the issues are as they go forward. And questions about what needs to be done, well, as a police department, we're not making the changes, so I recommend it if there's any issue that you have, you reach out to your local elected officials. Marsha. Um, I noticed that the transit crime is up, and I'm wondering if any of the transit crimes have to do with the increase in the We've seen a number of trains, full trains that have been I wonder if it's a bigger problem and what the NYPD is going to deal with, with this issue. Uh, Chief Delatore. Uh, no, the uh, transit crime is up primarily due to robberies. Uh, we're up uh, about 60 crimes, 40 of them are robberies, and the overwhelming majority of those robberies were in Brooklyn. Uh, within Brooklyn, we had a lot of small groups out there committing these robberies. And we've uh, pretty much arrested most of those groups, if not all of them at this point. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing those robberies now stabilize and go back to uh, normal levels. What are you doing to deal with the repeat problem? There have been a number of major incidents, and um, I wonder, you know, they basically get into the trains where the trains are doing layovers and paint the whole train from one end to the Yes, so we, we've been dealing with that for some time now. Actual, those, are, those large scale graffiti issues were actually down last year, not up. Uh, we have specialized teams that work with Interpol and international police throughout the world actually to track these tourists that come into New York to commit these graffiti crimes. Uh, we track them and we've had some significant arrests in those areas as well. We know that in the past there have been tourists that come to New York for that purpose. To graffiti a train, and we be careful of the interpretation artists, graffiti there artists. of tourists. Uh, it's we 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 certainly have homegrown people that do graffiti from time to time, but we also have people that do this for a living, and they come here and they travel from city to city. In some cases, from 
out of the country. I wouldn't quite label that as a tourist, but I think you know what I mean. Right. <laughs> there have been a number of instances in the last week or two where whole trains have been taken from one end to the other, um, you know, with, with uh, great abandon. And I wonder if you have any idea who these people are, if you have any uh, hope of arresting them. No, it, that's still under investigation. But we do know that, again, it's these traveling artists for the most part, that come from other parts of the country, sometimes in the city and sometimes other countries. But I'm surprised by that last part of the question. Does the NYPD have any hope of arresting someone who, oh, Marsha, just come on, you, you showed your hand a little there with all due respect. The question, I'm giving you an answer. I'm giving you an answer. The NYPD has an extraordinary, extraordinary record of arresting people who commit crimes. We take graffiti very seriously, we take quality of life very seriously. Again, you either want to root for New York City or you want to root against it. So let's be clear. If some people have graffiti to train, the overwhelming chance is they will be found and arrested and prosecuted just like every other crime in New York City. This is the finest police force in the nation. I don't know. If, if you or anyone else has suddenly lost faith in it, well, I think that's your problem. But the fact is, this NYPD knows how to fight crime and takes graffiti very seriously. Mayor, my question had to do with the fact that it was somebody from another country and arrest this person. I'm simply saying, it's just, let's not smokescreen this. Does the NYPD know how to fight crime more effectively than any police force on earth? Yes, and they find perpetrators constantly. Let's be clear about that. Gloria. Uh, you mentioned the uh, youth initiative and you said we're going to be looking at youth and miss intervention opportunities. And you, you mentioned a specific number of crimes and people. I just wondered if you could elaborate what exactly that means. Are you going to go back to find young uh, people who have offended and do what exactly? So we're, that's what part of, you know, youth stats about. There are going to be uh, many different agencies uh, at the <coughs> Maple uh, Center to talk this out. And again, we, we we are going to be asking Corp Council. We're going to be asking the Manhattan DA's office when it comes to prosecution. Is there something more that we could do to better prosecute these crimes? We're going to also be asking Corporation Council and the Manhattan DA's office for certain things. We're going to be speaking to probation uh, about you know the adjustment period and, and you know what they can tell us. Can 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 they tell us? Uh, certain things. Also, when I say missed opportunities, I mean looking at uh, juvenile reports. Maybe you know the most minor offenses. Did we follow up with, with with that juvenile? Did we follow up with his or her guardian? You know, maybe it's a school issue. Did we follow up with the the principal of the school, whoever it might be, the family coordinator from the school? So again, this this is a multi pronged approach using many different agencies. Uh, are there are there opportunities in that neighborhood? to existing services that maybe the officer that responds to the initial incident doesn't know about, to connect that kid that the mother is calling the police and saying, you know, uh, the, 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 the son and the daughter had a fight, or the son and the daughter broke something, or I can't control my son. So I, I think that there's incredible opportunities to connect to services, to work with other partners and providers. And that's one of the things that resonate with me when I go around the city. And, and I have this conversation, and I've had multiple people come up to me and say, I've been waiting for that discussion for so long. We're already doing it. How do we get involved? How do we help? So I don't view this as an NYPD solution, but we're damn sure going to be a big part of it, and we are very excited about it. So just a couple more questions, guys, one or two. I'll do Julia and then Ashley. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you said that you were repulsed by these anti-police protests in the subway. Is that the first time you've denounced them today? No. I denounced them on Saturday when they were over, and I've denounced similar things in the past. And then um, for the commissioner, um, Pat Lynch talked about uh, a political culture that denigrates and devalues the work uh, police officers do. Would you like to see more elected officials come out and denounce those protests? As I would like to done? see all New Yorkers come out, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think that was amateur hour. I think they give good, hard-working protesters a bad name. That was, <laughs> that was ridiculous. I mean, I think we can agree that, you know, having a cause and a protest is a good thing. I can remember walking, as I'm sure we all can, 
hours and hours with protests and a and hundred percent respect for many different causes over the last 29 years. That's part of this great country. But let's, let's be clear, and, and I forget what paper it was, but there was an editorial on this, is not a, this was not a protest. This was criminal activity by misguided people that were a bunch of knuckleheads, quite frankly. I mean, you're lighting garbage can fires in a transit system. My God, what could possibly go wrong with that? Yeah, right. <laughs> Somebody falling down a stairs, a smoke condition. Forget the damage to the property. Pointing lasers in cops' eyes. Really, how dare them? And we thank them for being stupid enough to videotape most of what they did, because Rodney's detectives will be relentless to make sure they all get arrested. I'm not done. Hold on. Really? Throwing a lock at a plate glass window so a woman sitting inside the restaurant gets glass in her eye. I mean, they, really, they, they should be ashamed of themselves. And to end where I started, every New Yorker should denounce it. That's not to say against protest. Protest is great. It's a healthy thing. But this was not a protest. I, I promise to ask you. Uh, Commissioner and Mayor, uh, the infant who was killed uh, at the end of last month, uh, his father had a, uh, a history of domestic violence and child abuse investigations by both the NYPD and uh, ACS. How do you explain... Ashley, this is the Suffolk County incident? No. no. This is the Bronx. The Bronx. Incident. Got it. Um, how do you explain... How do you explain what happened here? Why these children were still in that home? And if what what was the NY, was particular? I want to know what the NYPD um, if this family was under monitoring, given their past history of domestic violence. So, Ashley, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll run with that that inquiry. So, a couple complaints uh, did occur in 2015, 2016, uh, but that was more geared with the father versus the, the mother. There was one incident that occurred in 2016 uh, where the perpetrator of this heinous crime um, assaulted um, his, his wife, but yet at the same time during that process destroyed some of the toys of the kids. So technically outside of that, there was necessarily no abuse towards the kids uh, within that household. Um, this was a horrific incident. Um, he's been charged with murder. Uh, hopefully he goes away forever. And uh, it's just something that uh, is very, very disturbing. Yeah, yes, I don't know if the mayor wants to jump in, but I'll say before. I mean, I, I echo Rodney's thoughts there. Um, as a parent, as I'm sure um, all of us feel, I mean, what a terrible, terrible incident. Anytime we have an incident, such as this um, that occurs, whether it's a domestic violence homicide, an, an incident with a child, there's an intensive review um, that takes place in, in Chief Monahan's domestic violence unit that takes place um, through the Comstat process to, to learn, you know, what if anything could be done differently? What if anything was missed? Where are there gaps in the system? Um, we, we, we will you know, follow the law in these cases, um, but we, we certainly, um, you know, we'll make that part of the process going forward. There is nothing identified that has been brought to my attention with this case that was done in inappropriately, but um, we certainly feel for the family. Yeah. It's already part of the NYPD policy to monitor households where there are past histories of domestic violence, and in the last year, he's had at least two arrests for DV. So I'm wondering if they were, in fact, being monitored. And um, I, I would also like to mayor to, the mayor to address the ACS investigations, given that there are multiple. But, but there is a there is a process that is outside the NYPD determining um, taking children out of a home. Um, so that's not something, if there was a, an imminent fear in a particular situation, then ACS would be notified and ultimately a judge would make a determination. Um, we do follow up on, on domestic violence incidents routinely through this city, try, video, uh, try outreach. Um, we have domestic violence officers as well as uh, advocates that are assigned in every precinct and, and uh, uh, throughout PSAs throughout this city because we put such a priority on it. 
Um, but unfortunately, we still do have incidents to take place from time to time. Ashley, okay, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, at part of that monitoring when you when the officers from the precinct go and follow up with the family, if you have in a couple where there's partner intimate partner violence, but there are children in the home, are you also looking at the children? Absolutely. Uh, again, that's all voluntary, though. This is all voluntary. There's no court order. There's no right for us to go into somebody's home. So it's a very delicate uh, situation. Yeah. Ashley, to the question, again, I, I'm responding as a parent as well. We need to know how this happened, why this happened, how it was possible this happened. There's, you won't be surprised to know there's uh, really strict confidentiality issues anytime we're talking about an ACS case. But I think your question is a very fair one. Is there the kind of coordination that we need to have between all different agencies to make sure a child is safe? That's exactly what we're looking at right now, and we'll have more to say uh, as we get the full investigation back. This is general off topic. General, general. off topic. Okay. So let's see. So those who need to 